So how do you define advanced heart failure? One of the problems is there really is a lack of a standard definition in this field. Various names have been proposed, whether you call it advanced heart failure, end stage heart failure, refractory heart failure, or as ACCHA call it, stage D heart failure. And uh, they define that as refractory heart failure um, requiring specialized uh, inter intervention. One of the first advances in this field is that the stage D group was subdivided by the Intermax uh, organization. And what they did is they took that uh, stage D group and they subdivided it into various profiles called the Intermax profiles. And those are shown here. Um, and there's seven of them. The first one uh, is Intermax profile one, critical cardiogenic shock. And they came up with these really nice kind of poetic names for them, the descriptive labels. This group is called the crash and burn group. These are patients who, if you don't intervene within hours or maybe a day, they'll be dead. And then progressively less sick patients, Intermax profile two, progressive decline, inotropes sliding. These are patients who are on inotropes but just are not clinically stable. Whereas Intermax profile three are patients who are on inotropes and are who stable. And then these are progressively less sick patients. I think in the lexicon already, Intermax profiles one through three are very useful. When, patient, when people call me up and tell me they have an Intermax one, I get it right away. Whereas before, if it was a patient, was they, someone would say class four, you don't really know quite how ill that patient was. So I think it's worth knowing already these Intermax one through three categories. Now, uh, how do we identify these patients with advanced heart failure? If a patient is inotrope dependent, the news is very bad. This is essentially hospice level care. This was first shown by Ray Hirschberger now over a decade ago in a small series where he showed that at the end of one year, basically everyone was dead on patients who had been sent home on chronic inotropes. More recent data have come from uh, Cleveland Clinic, and whether you're on milrinone or dobutamine, the prognosis if you're inotrope dependent at one year is still about under 50%, and two-year survival is even worse. So if you have a patient who is truly dependent on inotropes, you need to do something else for them, or consider a referral to palliative or, uh, services or hospice, because really their outcomes are that bad. The idea is, can we identify patients before they progress to that point? Is there a way to pick them up earlier in their disease process? And these are some simple clinical clues that have now been advocated um, and has been put forth as ways to identify patients. And the first one is this rehospitalization for heart failure. Everyone in the room is really tuned to the rehospitalization for heart failure due to the re reimbursement penalties that our hospitals face if we have high readmission rates. But for the purposes of today, the question is, is there prognostic utility in these rehospitalization rates? We all know that the rates are about 20 to 25 percent of 30 days, and almost half our patients will be readmitted within six months. And the question is, does that identify a high-risk patient population or not? Well, if you go and look at large databases, this is from the VA, this is across the country, the Medicare database, it's fairly amazing how after an indexed heart failure hospitalization, the one-year mortality rate approaches 30%. That's all comers for their first hospitalization for heart failure. Almost a third of your patients will be dead at the end of one year. It's pretty sobering news. But what happens for those patients who are on that revolving door? Well, this is, these are data from Canada, and what's shown here is after the first year in Canada, just like in the United States, about a 30% one-year mortality after the first hospitalization. But look what happens after you have a second, third, and fourth hospitalization. There's a progressive and incremental increase in the mortality. The patient has four hospitalizations, four hospitalization, you're already up to about a 60% mortality. And in this field now, most of us are saying it really takes two hospitalizations in one year. So if you're about on this red line here, about a 40% one-year mortality, that's the trigger to consider referral to an advanced heart failure center. So if the person has one admission, they go home, and you can't keep them clinically stable, it's a big warning sign to think about referring that patient on to an advanced heart failure center. There are some other simple clinical clues that have been uh, proven useful. The next one on the list is intolerance to medications. And whether the patient is intolerant to ACE inhibitors or beta blockers, that identifies a high-risk population. These are data from the Brigham and Women's. This is uh, from an advanced heart failure population center where patients got sent home, and then they got classified. If the patient got sent home on an inotrope, we already seen that. The mortality is dismal. The patient gets sent home on an ACE inhibitor. That's their survival. Whereas if they get sent home and they are taken off the ACE inhibitor due to what's called circulatory renal limo limitation, meaning they get hypotensive or they develop an elevation in the creatinine sufficient that you have to stop the ACE inhibitor, look at their survival rate. At one year, it's about 50%. 
So before you see those data, you probably would stop the ACE inhibitor, you probably go home, you probably wouldn't even spend one nanosecond thinking about that event in that day, in the course of the day. But in reality, if you have to pull the ACE inhibitor off your patient, not because of cough, not because of angioedema, but because of hypotension or renal dysfunction, and you have to discharge them off ACE inhibitor, that is a seminal event in that patient's life and identifies a very high risk uh, population that you should consider referral on. Now, there's some other clinical clues, just because of the sake of time, I'm not going to go through these in depth. But as the diuretic doses are needed to be escalated, as Dr. Lobel or Dr. Hoglar call me up and give me bad news, our electrophysiologists, the patient's getting shocked from the ICD, or they put the BIV pacer in, and the LV did not recover. That's a warning sign, high-risk population. The labile renal function as the cranine and BUN rise. The saying is that the kidneys don't lie. And that's certainly true. As that cranine elevates and the BUN elevates, things are going poorly. And then if the patient cannot defend their body weight and they have cardiac cachexia, that's another ominous sign that the patient is a high-risk patient and has advanced heart failure. So these are some simple clinical clues. It's always kind of sad when I get a patient referred and they're an extremist. They're intermax profile one. They have the impellin. They have the balloon pump in. And you go back and you look at the chart, and you saw that the diuretics were being escalated, the ACE was pulled off, they'd been shocked from their ICD, the cranny had gone up. It was like they were crying out for help, and it's just that no one heard. So those are very helpful, simple clinical clues to keep in mind. Doesn't, you don't have to be able to hear a soft, intermittent S3. These are very easy things to identify. Okay, let's move on to a treatment now, talking about LVADs and heart transplantation. And as I said, if the patient is on chronic inotropes, that really identifies the patient population um, that should be referred on. You know, put a plug into the palliative care service. They've been very helpful um, in our care of these, this patient population because just because you don't have a therapy that can prolong survival does not mean you don't have a therapy that can, can help the patient and the family in the terminal phases of their illness. But let's see what else we can do. And first we'll focus in on ventricular assist devices. And there really are two main roles of VADs in our therapy. The first is what's called bridge to transplant. That's for patients who are transplant candidates, but they're so sick that they're not going to be able to stay alive long enough until a donor heart becomes available. So we put the OVAD in, we bridge them, we keep them alive until a transplant becomes available. The second patient population are those who patients who are non-transplant candidates, and all they get is the LVAD. That is the destination. And essentially what happened was that the bridge to transplant LVAD experience was so good that people said, well, wait a minute, why not just use that for the patients who are not transplant candidates, and that's all they get. And that's really where the growth is in this field, is in terms of treatment of destination therapy. Well, this is the first uh, LVAD that really made it to market um, in any meaningful sense. This is the old HeartMate XVE. The way this works is the blood, this is uh, implanted internally, the blood goes from the left ventricle into this device, gets pumped out to the aorta. This is all internal until this point here where this drive line about the thickness of a pencil exits the body, hooks up to the system controller, that's the computer that runs the pump, and then is hooked up to two battery packs, only one is shown here about the size of a VCR tape, um, for those of you who remember what VCR sizes are. Um, and, uh, and then the patient always needs energy. You always need to power these pumps um, because they're mechanical devices. And the reason this is the first pump that really was a landmark pump is shown here. This is the uh, rematch trial. This was a series that took patients with optimum medical therapy at leading medical centers versus patients who got an LVAD. And what you can see is that the patients who got an LVAD, this is looking at survival over about four years, patients with LVAD did better. They live longer. It's a proof of concept that compared to the very best medical therapy we have, if you put an LVAD in, you can prolong survival. On the other hand, if you look at the outcomes of the LVAD patients, this wasn't that good. A two-year survival rate of only 28%. A lot of that was due to mechanical failure of these LVADs. Literally, you would start to see mechanical shavings come out in a filter, and you knew that this pump was going to fail shortly thereafter. So most physicians looked at it, said this is a big pump. Quality of life wasn't great. It was noisy. You only get two-year survival rates of 28%. It really wasn't used that broadly. But again, a landmark trial proving the point that if Compared to the very best medical therapy, LVADs can prolong survival. We just need better technology. Field to move very quickly. This is now the second generation LVAD. This is a continuous flow device. You can see it's hooked up in the same configuration as the older XVE. But what's different is that the, although we call it a pump, it's really a rotor that spins and propels the blood forward. 
you can see you still need to have the battery packs, the system controller. But what's really amazing about these continuous flow pumps is that as the blood gets propelled forward, you start to lose all pulsatile flow in the body. So this is looking at arterial waveforms as you crank these devices up. This is not the HeartMate device, but it's the same idea. That as you crank these devices up and you increase the RPMs, you start to lose all pulsatility. So the patient has no radial pulse. Dr. Uh, Isle will not be, Adam will not be able to get into the radial artery because it's very hard to feel it. You can really trick your medical students if you're mean. There is no pulse. Carotid fem nowhere. So it's really amazing to see these patients and watch a person walk around for years and have, uh, and seemingly the human body can tolerate that. Well, this pump was compared to the older pump in a randomized trial. This is the HeartMate 2 destination trial. And you can see, this was published now uh, five or six years ago, that the continuous flow pump was better, that we, with the better technology, we had improvement in outcome. And as I said, the field has moved really quickly. This is the next pump that is, became available, the hardware pump. Look how small this thing is. It literally fits in the palm of your hand, and it gets implanted. It's so small, it can get implanted in the pericardial space, and is shown here. This is, I have to say, the easiest trial I've ever been involved in, in terms of getting patients to participate. We showed the two pumps. They saw the small one. They said, I want it. It was amazing. <laughs> so this is uh, uh, really amazing. Now, which bad for which of your patients? The approved pumps, the HeartMate 2 is approved both for bridge and destination, and the hardware is approved for bridge. The destination trial has been done, but has not yet been approved. The outcomes, uh, comparatively, as far as we can tell, seem to be about the same, in, in my opinion. So how do we improve our VAD outcomes? Well, we saw already that better technology, the newer pump was better than the older pump in the destination HeartMate trial. But another way we can improve our outcomes is with better patient selection. And that's shown here. If you take patients when they're critically ill in that Intermax 1, 2 category, the outcomes are not nearly as good as if you can get them just a little earlier in the disease cascade. And that's why it's so important to identify them with those simple clinical clues before they progress to that Intermax 1 with the impeller or the, or the balloon pump and see if we can get them a little earlier because the outcomes following the LVAD will go much better. And the concept there is that we want to find a sweet spot. You don't want to implant too early because then you're exposing your patient to the risk of the LVAD without the benefit. But on the other hand, if you wait too late, the risk goes up and it gets into this concept of futile implants, where the risk is just too high and the outcome is not going to be good. And what we want is the sweet spot, the Goldilocks, the optimum window for LVAD. Now, there are complications with these devices. It's better than medical therapy, but they certainly come with a number of complications that are worth knowing. First is their LVADs. They support the left ventricle. So not surprisingly, some patients have such severe right heart failure that even though you unload the left ventricle, they're still left with right heart failure. You have a driveline exiting the body. It's an external, you know, breaking the skin, a foreign object. Not surprising that those can get infected, and we see driveline infections. A lot of these patients get GI bleeding through AVMs. People believe it's similar to the pathophysiology of what you see with aortic stenosis, where you have a narrow pulse pressure. Perhaps it's due to shearing of the von Willebrand factor. It's not yet clear, but this is a real clinical problem where we have a number of patients who have significant recurrent GI bleeds due to AVMs. Another complication that's emerged and perhaps was not anticipated is development of aortic insufficiency. And what is shown here is the risk of developing aortic sufficiency. Comparing patients where the aortic valve, these are all patients that had LVADs. These are patients who the valve opened all the time or intermittently versus patients where the aortic valve stays closed because all the blood was going through the LVAD. And the, what you see is that those patients had to close the aortic valve all the time were at a higher risk of developing this aortic insufficiency. And the concept here is that as the aortic valve stays closed, the valve leaf would start to fuse, and then they degenerate, and then you get aortic insufficiency. Another complication that is a, a real issue or a real concern is that these are pumps and they can clot off. And many in the room may have seen this New England Journal article now a couple years ago where the, these authors demonstrated that there was a significant increase in the LVAD thrombosis. These are the rate before 2011. And then after 2011, this was four centers that combined their data with the HeartMate 2 and showed that there's this dramatic increase in the rate of thrombosis. It's not clear if there was something with the pump or something because Centers change the anticoagulation strategies, but certainly caught the attention around the country. The risk that I am most worried about is the strokes. This is the one that really gives me pause before I refer my patient for implantation. These pumps require Coumadin plus an antiplatelet agent, and in the DT trial, the stroke rate was 13% 
in the patient year. And even more recent data, this is from Intermax, at one year, it was an 11% stroke rate. So one in 10 risk of having a stroke in that first year is certainly something that gives me pause before I refer patients with not severe heart failure to get one of these pumps. I don't want to end on a bad note, though, because if you look at the, the, this field in the short order from 2001 to 2009, this was the original XVE rematch medical therapy. This was the pulsatile. This is the continuous flow. And look how rapidly the field has moved, where the survival rates have come up so quickly and dramatically due to this newest technology. And in fact, the most recent Intermax survival data suggests that there's an 80% one year and 70% two year survival. Perhaps not surprisingly, this is just looking at the rates of uh, numbers of implants. The red is a continuous flow, and you can see there's this exponential increase. All over the country, these pumps are being implanted, and I think many physicians are starting to think this is a reasonable strategy, which gets me to raise the question, are we at the tipping point? Are we at the point where these will become modern day accepted, widely accepted therapy to treat patients with heart failure? The fact that many people saw Vice President Cheney out with one of these really has changed the conversation I have with patients. When I first talked about LVADs with patients, their eyes would get big and they'd look at me like, you want to do what to me? Now, it's, is this something that Vice President Cheney, is that what Vice President Cheney had? It's really changed the way I think people view this technology. The last thing is future uh, assist device technology uh, to reintroduce pulsatility. And that's shown here. These are some data from our group in collaboration with Ben Levine. This is looking at patients who have pulsatile LVAD. This is the sympathetic nervous system activation. And patients who have this continuous flow, the barrier receptors are not being stretched because there's no pulsatile flow. So the sympathetic nervous system in these patients with continuous flow LVADs is going haywire. It is markedly activated. And so now the idea is the engineers are going to reintroduce pulsatility into these pumps. These are the data with the HeartMate 3, whereby rapidly alternating the speed of the pump, so you take it down from uh, 1,500 and you speed it up to, say, 5,500, and you cycle that speed, and when you slow the pump down, they were able to demonstrate they could reintroduce pulsatility into the circulation. The HeartMate 3 is now entering in clinical trials, um, and, uh, but many, many com the companies now, this is where the field is moving, to reintroduce pulsatility into these continuous flow pumps. I'll finish just quickly on transplantation. We've just passed the 47th uh, anniversary where Dr. Bernard made worldwide fame, transplanted Lewis Wisconsky. Um, and the problem with the transplantation from the perspective of heart failure is that the supply of donor hearts is limited. There's about 2,000, 2,500, 40,000 patients potentially could benefit. It will never solve the problem from a public health perspective. Um, they are precious resources, and uh, we have to allocate them wisely. What do you get when you transplant a patient? These are data from ISHLT. This is uh, the blue line is from older. This is more recent data. But you can see on average, if a patient asks you, what can I expect if I get transplanted, you can see that the median survival rate is about 10 or 11 years. So about half the patients who go on to transplant will live about 11 years. That's a reasonable number to tell your patients when they ask you, what, what will you get? So let me finish here and say that advanced heart failure represents a spectrum of illness. I do think the Intermax categorization the profiles are worth knowing, particularly one through three. In patients inotrope dependent, that is ominous. But for those not in inotropes, there are simple clues. Rehospitalization has emerged as probably the number one clue. But intolerance to medications as the diuretic doses escalate, kidneys give out, patients get shocked, or if they start to lose weight from cardiac cachexia, these are all warning signs to think about referring your patients on. VADs are rapidly emerging. Survival is better than medical therapy. There are complications. We talked about GI bleeding, aortic insufficiency. We talked about VAT thrombosis. And the one that concerns me the most is the 10% stroke rate. But as technologies get better and patient selection gets better, I think we are quickly approaching the tipping point. And then lastly, transplantation does provide an excellent option, but is simply limited due to the number of donors we have. Thank you so much.